Please welcome Deidre Maklowski. Deidre Maklowski from 2000 to 2015 taught economics, history, English, and communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago, being a distinguished professor in economics and history. She was educated at Harvard and taught for a dozen years in economics and then also in history at the University of Chicago, tenured and 19 years later at the University of Iowa. Author of 17 books and editor of eight others and over 400 scholarly articles, she is well known internationally in economics, economic history, rhetorical theory, philosophy of science, gender studies, and various other fields. She describes herself now as a postmodern, free market, quantitative Episcopalian feminist Aristotelian. Her latest books are Bourgeois Dignity, How Ideas, Not Capital or Institutions Enrich the World, Bourgeois Dignity, Why Economics Can't Explain the Modern World, and The Cult of Statistical Significance, How the Standard Error Causes Jobs, Justice, and Lives. Please welcome Deidre Miklowski. I'm very old. In fact, you know, the trouble is that, that, that David Friedman is old too. He's my age. He and I were almost classmates at Harvard College. And uh, he's in much better shape than I am. So, you know, I, I have, to, have to sit down mainly for my talk. Oh my God, this chair. <laughs> this chair loves me. In brief, the claim of this book and the, and the two others that were mentioned in the trilogy that I completed, this completed a couple of years ago, is that what makes us rich is being free. Now, there, I, I started this project by wanting to defend capitalism against its numerous enemies. Say that capitalism is about greed and we socialists, we aren't greedy, which anyone who's lived under a socialist regime knows is false. So, some of your, your, your parents and grandparents of the, of the Serbians here know that. But then it, it they, so, so the first volume was saying that you can be good and be a capitalist, or a worker, or an entrepreneur. <laughs> See, look how thick this is. This is the third volume. I put everything that I hadn't said in the first two in it, and now it can stand by itself. It's that thick. The others were 500 pages each. This is 700. So, the, the, I, was, I was defending, as I have much of my life, the free markets against socialism and against the, the claim that there's something uniquely corrupting about a market. And my argument was that that was not so. That after all, come on, a socialist bureaucracy is corrupt. And an aristocracy of feudal lords is corrupt. A church can be corrupt. So there's nothing especially corrupt about uh, a market society, and in fact, on the contrary, it's often um, pretty nice. You come into an American store, shop, and the owner or the clerk says, how can I help you? Well, what's wrong with that? I give, <laughs> I give the store money, they give me something I want. Everyone's improved. But then it occurred to me, this was a great step, that this, that, that this defense of capitalism could be turned to explaining why it's been so successful. Now, of course, our friends on the left, and I have lots of friends on the left, I was once myself a Marxist, so I, I kind of understand why they're so um, enthusiastic for uh, regulation or um, uh, central planning or against markets and so forth. It occurred to me that I might have my hands on 
an explanation of the success of capitalism. They say it's not a success of capitalism. They say it's a success of science, perhaps, that made us rich. Or a success of, uh, I don't know, government activity. Industrial policy, for example. Or the great infrastructure, a very dangerous word, that the government has provided. And I, I, I doubted that as an economic historian. And I thought that the real source of our enrichment is innovation, not capital accumulation, not exploitation, but innovation. Electric lights, some of them very bright. Ah. Uh, wood that's made with saws, uh, power saws, um, you know, books, they're cheap on Amazon.com, cheap, cheap, cheap. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in favor of commerce. I believe in free speech and advertising. So, the, and here's the, here's the basic insight that I finally figured out. It took me quite a while. Well, the first insight was that the, the usual explanations for economic growth and our enrichment are not very persuasive. And the main reason they're not persuasive is that the size of economic growth per head, per person, is very, very large. From, in, in 1800, the average person in the world, with the exception of, of a few, I don't know, kings and, and, uh, and, and uh, cardinals and so forth, was about $3 a day. In terms of money you could spend in this in, in this city right now. Try living on $3 a day here and now. Now it's not impossible for societies to do that because there are still countries in the world in which, Zimbabwe for example, in which it's $3 a day. But now, the average rich country, say the United States, the income per head in the same prices, allowing for inflation, now hear this, is $130 a day. The sort of average rich country, well, the, the United States is not the richest country in the world. My ancestor's country of Norway is much better off, but still only, say, 10% better off or 20%. But the, uh, a place like Britain, $110 a day. A place like Japan, about $100 a day. A place like Italy, about $90 a day. So, in Serbia too, the change is gigantic. Because you start from this very low level, and now in Serbian income per head must be about $50 or $60 a day. I'm not sure of the exact figure, but let's go with that. But it's roughly that. And even if it's $50 or $60, it's a factor of, what, 15. A factor of 15. 1,500% approximately. And on average in the world, it's about a factor of 30. Now this, had, to put it mildly, had never happened before, not even close. Occasionally there'd be a doubling, right? Uh, in the Italian Renaissance, maybe, I don't know. Or indeed the classic Industrial Revolution from 1760 to 1860 in Britain was about a doubling. But dears, that's only 100%. And we're talking about 3,000%. And the explanations, whether from the right in terms of investment or from the left in terms of exploitation, they aren't big enough to get to 3,000%. It's not a good business plan to steal from poor people. But that's the claim on the left about imperialism. That Europe is rich because it exploited Africa and South Asia and Brazil and so forth. And that's, that's crazy. That's not, not, it's not the right order of magnitude. Would you do well by stealing from the homeless people in your neighborhood? I don't think so. If you're going to steal from someone, steal from France. And, and on the other hand, 
a, a, an economic feature of both sides, both the right and the left, the conservatives and the socialists, is capital accumulation. That's supposed to make us rich. Sheer capital accumulation without new ideas doesn't make you rich. If you just pile up housing and theaters and so forth, there's, as John Maynard Keynes, the hero of my youth, said, there's sharply diminishing returns. And you don't get close to 3,000%. You can't even double people's income by just giving them capital. What you need is decent, good ideas to use the capital. This is a very Austrian type point, Austrian economics. You've, the, the details of what you're using it for is what matters. So the key thing that enriched us, as I said before, is ingenuity. Just one example, I've given hundreds of them in this book and the, and the two previous. One example, containerization. Invented in 1956 by a guy who owned a trucking firm. He had grown up a poor boy, so he didn't go, go, to, go to university, but he started a trucking firm, and then he said to himself, now wait a second, maybe I can make a big box the size of, a, of, a, of an 18-wheeler trailer, right? Or the size approximately of a railway car, a railway freight car. And then I can put these on ships, pile them up, and send stuff to Europe. And then the Europeans can send back stuff in the box. The advantage of the box is there isn't any stealing. It's very easy to unload. Instead of unloading each sack of, I don't know, tobacco, you have an entire uh, box filled with tobacco, and you, it, you, you can unload it all at once. And what's happened is that containerization has created globalization. The prices of TVs in China and the United States are approximately the same because it's so easy to ship it without any of the TVs getting stolen, and you can ship hundreds of TVs in a single box. Now here's the point. There were thousands of those ideas. Millions of them. Let me just mention one more example. I won't give a big talk on it. Reinforced concrete, which makes it possible to, big skies, big, to, to build tall buildings. I live in a former factory which is 13 stories tall, made, it, made entirely of reinforced concrete. Concrete is an ancient invention. The Chinese had it, the Romans had it. But you can make a tall building out of it if you put steel into the concrete. Again, it doesn't involve any high science. You gotta have cheap steel. That's all. It's just an idea. Now, now think about that. If it's ideas that made us rich, and that's correct, it's not capital, it's not exploitation, why did the ideas come in a great rush after 1800? And here's my core argument, the core reason I'm here. I say it in this book, to some extent in the middle one, and I hadn't, by the at time of the first one, 2006, I hadn't quite figured this out. It happened because of liberalism, in one word, liberalism. Now, what's liberalism? We're very confused about it, as you may know, in the United States. In the case of Hillary Clinton, who I wish had won the election, but not because I admire her so much, but because I don't admire Donald Trump. But in the case of Clinton, she calls herself a liberal. Well. In one sense, she is, because she doesn't despise people like me, transge transgendered people. And her husband slowly got the idea that gay people in the military were, were, was not a bad idea. And she's certainly always been in favor of, 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 of women's rights. And yes, good for her. But in the economy, in economic stuff, she's a socialist. I'd call Hillary, I think if she'd hear, she'd be, you know, we could eventually agree that she's in favor of slow socialism. 
you get to socialism with regulation and you bring more and more things under the government and the government nudges people and I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. One of the most unbelievable sentences in English. The other two is are the check is in the mail and of course I'll respect you in the morning. <laughs> so, but I'm using the word the way everyone else in the world does to mean free markets. And, 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 and more, more fundamentally though, equality. Now, not French style equality, not Thomas Piketty's idea of equality, not Rousseau, but the blessed Adam Smith. Now watch how I do it. See, I, di I did it the orthodox way. Because, you know, I'm, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm a, and I'm an Anglican, but I'm prepared to honor Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism and all the rest. But okay, what's liberalism? In Adam Smith's view, it was, he said, the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. What he meant by those three words is equality of dignity, not equality of outcome. That's, that's Rousseau. But equality of respect. And I think everyone in this room feels you should respect everyone. Yeah, whether they're high or low, you should offer dignity to everyone. And that was Adam Smith's view. He was, for his time, he was a radical egalitarian of this sort. Not the distribution after production, but the respect before. And then liberty, in his definition, was, was liberty of enterprise. If you want to start a hairdressing salon, which by the way I desperately need, um, you're allowed to. The government can't stop you. In Brazil, it takes a hundred days to start a, a, a new enterprise. In New Zealand, it takes one day. And so that, there's, there's a measure of the difference between an illiberal and a liberal regime so far as as liberty of enterprise is concerned. And then justice is equal justice before the law. That means an independent judiciary. There are only two things necessary for a free society. If you haven't got both of them, you don't have a free society. An independent judiciary and absolute freedom of the press uh, and of speech. If you don't have both of those, the other declines. So here's my claim. This idea of the 18th century, the intellectuals, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and Tom Paine and, and uh, 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 Adam Smith and, and Voltaire and so forth, this idea was beginning to be applied then in Britain and the United States. It had already started to be applied a couple of centuries before in Holland. And this idea grew and grew and grew in its popularity. This idea of liberalism. And that, the whole idea of equality of people is to bring more and more people into the society as full per, per, participants. Now the man who wrote, all men and women, dear, are created equal and are endowed with their creator certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, was a slave owner. This is uh, our man, uh, 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 um, Jefferson. So Tom really had some problems. But the phrase is typical of 18th century liberal thought, the, the sentences. And it, it kept working in the United States. It kept shaming people. We hadn't freed the slaves. Early in the history of the United States, poor men couldn't vote. Until 1919, 
women couldn't vote. In this shocking 100-year period of homophobia in Northern Europe, um, being gay was a crime from about 1870 to 1970. Uh, uh, um, and so forth and so forth, but gradually gays were freed. Colonial people worldwide were freed after the war, after the Second War. Eventually, Eastern Europe was freed. Freedom kept growing by bringing more and more people into this uh, free economy. Now, unfortunately, at the same time, the power of the modern state grew. And the modern state, well, you see it in uh, the, this shocking Chinese ability to do face recognition so that they can pick out the suspicious person that they're pursuing out of 100,000 people. They can do it now. That gives the state a tool which is extremely dangerous. Um, it, it, so so the, the technology of the modern state and its pretenses, it's, I can't actually see that sign. You'll have to come closer. I can't see it. No, I still can't see it. You have to, you have to get out of the light. Ten more minutes, thank you. And then the next time, tell me out loud. Um, I'm half blind anyway, so, you know. But, but th there's this rise in the power of the state to do evil and good, mainly evil. And on the other hand, there's the power of the market gradually expanding. And I think it's quite plain that our, our high income comes not, as I said before, from government activities on the whole, but from our, our, our freedoms. Now, I was just discussing this morning with a colleague of yours this whole story, and she and I came up with a very interesting argument that I'd like to tr try out on you. David's father, Milton Friedman, was a colleague of mine uh, for 12 years at the University of Chicago. Actually, he was out in Stanford most of the time, but anyway, he was my colleague, and I ad admire him very much. And Milton Friedman wrote famously that a free market economy, free exchange, is, leads to, this may be a bit of a vulgar way of thinking of Milton's thought, but leads to freedom in other ways. Freedom of the press, freedom of re religion, and so forth. And here's the trouble with that argument, is this, this um, young, young, young woman and I decided. <clears throat> the problem is that there have been market societies since the beginning of our race. There's one race, it's called the human race, Homo uh, um, sapiens. Everyone in this room is a former African. The whole human race comes from Africa. And the trouble, we, 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 we know more and more, we've learned from archaeology and economic history and so forth, that the market is ubiquitous. We've always had markets. Her example was Saudi Arabia, which is certainly a market economy. It's got a big, powerful state, but my God, the Saudi Arabians or the Arabians in general have been merchants since the time of, of the Prophet and before. It's all right. So it's a merchant society. And yet, it's not a free society. So this is a counterexample to Milton's argument. Huh. And, it, and here's why I think it's an important argument for me. Because I'm claiming that the idea of liberalism was the key to the modern world. It made us free for sure, but it also made us rich. And this shows that the market itself can't do that. You need the ideological change. You need the change in, 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 in ethics and, and rhetoric that we in this room are trying to achieve in our, our societies. So I would say that there's a very strong argument that the ideological change of free markets is what made us rich. In a way, it's a strange argument because for an economist to make, I'm an economist, because it's not materialist. 
there are materialist influences and it works on matter, makes us rich, but the source is not material, it's spiritual. There was a change increasingly after 1800 in how people felt themselves um, worthy of freedom. And our job in this room is to convince them of that right now. Thank you very much. Buy the book.